What's up, everybody? It's Butch from Southie Cichlids. Uh, give a couple minutes, a couple seconds, to let uh, a few other people get in, and then we'll get started. So, this is my friend, Thomas Lapel, and He's from Germany, and Thomas and I have known each other for about 12 years now, since I first started ordering from Germany. And uh, he worked for my previous supplier, uh, and now Thomas is on his own, uh, doing his own thing, and he and I have been working together now for several months, getting fish in, and he has been here with me since uh, last Thursday. Um, we've had a lot of time to talk about uh, fish and uh, business and partnerships and all sorts of good things. And uh, actually, it's Tomas, 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 <laughs> Tomas. But for all this time, I call him Thomas. It's Thomas, <laughs> and he calls me Donald because that's uh, my. Uh, a legal name, I guess you could say. Uh, so that, that's always been kind of fun. Um, so, anyways, uh, we were just gonna do a video tonight. Uh, let you guys ask any questions that you have. Uh, Thomas has been in this business for 30 years. He has experience uh, lakeside. He travels to Africa uh, once, sometimes twice a year. He is. Uh, to uh, Tanzania, uh, Dar es Salaam. Uh, he's dove in the lake, both lakes, many, many times. Uh, he has a vast, vast knowledge of both lakes and the fish that come from it. Um, so, uh, we are going to try to do our best with this. Uh, we have Andrea behind or in front of us, and she's going to try to uh, get y'all's messages to us. Um, and we'll answer as best as we can. Just do your best to uh, go slow and clear with your questions. Um, uh, English is not uh, Thomas's, uh, what did you say? Mother's language. Mother's <laughs> language. And uh, we are not professional uh, video makers or YouTubers. Uh, you know, we're not no Adam C. We just the middle <laughs> Southeast cichlids. <laughs> So, um, Thomas, if you want to uh, say anything, and then we'll start taking some questions if people have any. Yeah, uh, Yeah. also, uh, hello everybody from my side, and um, don't worry, I can understand you quite well, uh, and I can also speak a little bit English, so um, if you uh, have questions, don't hesitate to ask me, and uh, yeah, and I'm sure that um, we are able to give you some some proper answers and uh, maybe you got something in your mind which you wanted to ask for a long time but you maybe did not have the chance to, to find somebody to ask so uh, yeah this evening maybe is, is a good chance for you and uh, also I spoke uh, to Donald that uh, late, later on we will make a walk through uh, his, uh, his fish house here and show you some some very nice fish with, which are available at the moment and um, yeah and we can also talk about them and uh, give you some more detailed information about uh, the fish which we will show you uh, yes. yeah I think that's what I can say for the mo moment and now I, I'm waiting for you to send us answers or uh, sorry questions uh, yeah or whatever you would like to do we're just waiting for you so um Russ D says that there's always great fish coming from across the pond. And Jason <laughs> wants to know, how come all the Euros get the nicest plecos? <laughs> to get the nicest plecos? Okay, this is uh, usually this is not my business. <laughs> 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 because, uh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm an East African cichlid specialist and uh, 
I don't work too much with Plecos, better to say I, I don't work with Plecos. So I'm sorry, but uh, in that case I cannot help you. <laughs> I want to know why you guys get the nicest hats. <laughs> yeah, what can I say? You know, um, for us Europeans, it's it's a long, long time that we always took care to have nice lines, nice breeding lines, and uh, do not the cross breeding uh, like it happens in Florida too often. And also, we're trying to get uh, to breed with wild fish and uh, always doing the the fresh blood stuff, you know, and trying to get some other fish in so uh, that you don't get too much inbreeding because this is what you really have to take care of because only if you do that you you can uh, keep the quality up so uh, i mean this is uh, that's all about it you know you just everyone have... wants good quality fish yes for sure yes uh, robert wants to know what is a good product to use to glue a rock formation in his aquarium real rocks um he did not say if they were real Silicone works well. Um, you can silicone the rocks together. Um, or you could get uh, like some artificial rocks, uh, maybe universal rocks uh, that are not real and you can stack them and you don't have to glue them together. But if you have some rocks that you really want to make a formation out of at home, I would use silicone. There are certain kind of silicone? Uh, yes, um, either aquarium grade silicone that you have to buy special, uh, or Home Depot carries a 100% acrylic. They don't sell it in the uh, painting aisle, it's off where they sell plastic sheets. It's for uh, plastic, 100% silicone, and it works great uh, for glass, and it doesn't have any of the uh, mold preventative in the silicone, which is very bad for your aquarium. Um, Michael said, Butch, hit me up when the new list is out. So when is the new list coming out? Um, good question. <laughs> uh, Thomas just sent me the new list from my kitchen to my office <laughs> this morning. Yeah. And we are going to work on getting that posted tomorrow. Uh, and uh, Thomas has been working on a wild Malawi shipment. Uh, that we've been waiting and waiting since he's been here for news and we got the news today that a lot of nice Malawi fish have been collected and will be on the way to Thomas hopefully late next week. The list I put out tomorrow will not have those fish uh, but as soon as Thomas gets them he will send me that list then I will put the additional list out and we're planning to have the shipment come in on the 30th yeah. of November. Yeah, and what I can say um, about the list which uh, which Donald will have uh, tomorrow to show you, uh, there are at the moment are a lot of very nice and also rare wild Tanganyikan fish on it because they are already available in, in our fish house. And um, so Donald can get them for you if you are interested. I hope that uh, also some, some Tanganyika fans are watching because there are some really, really beautiful uh, feather fins and really rare ones, like different color types of uh, Octa Mutilapia ventralis. And uh, yeah, so um, of course we are waiting for this big Malawi shipment too, but uh, anyway, the list is also interesting at the moment already, so take a look and take your time to check it. Michelle says, awesome, proud of you, Butch. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We're very proud. <laughs> so I have a question. What are we going to do with the 600? Uh, the 600, so uh, you, you guys can't see that right now, but um, uh, my good friend Ron was here uh, two weeks ago from Oregon to help me do a lot of projects in the shop, and he had been wanting to address some issues with the 600 for a long time and I said let's do it so we blew it apart uh, drained it uh, did some additional filtration work drilled some holes in the bottom for uh, ocean clear uh, filters along with the canister filters that were already running um, we siliconed the background back in place so the fish can't get behind it 
Um, anyways, what are we going to do with it? Um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to put uh, common haps uh, in this tank. Um, I have about 20 super duper nice, really big haps in my uh, show tank at home and they've kind of outgrown the 180. Uh, so I'm going to put them in the 600 along with several other common haps and a few predators. Um, and I think it's going to be pretty cool. And Ron said, hey Thomas and Donald, what's up? <laughs> what's up, Ron? <laughs> what's up, man? <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question. What's the um, the hardest part of shipping fish? Oof. The hardest part of shipping fish? Yeah. Um. Well, can I say something? Yeah. About it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Maybe I'm I'm the right person to to give an answer to that question because I, I'm doing the shipping for many many years now to many different countries all over the world and especially to Asia and also to Australia. So um, I, I think the hardest thing about shipping is uh, to have the knowledge uh, which fish are more sensitive, which ones are not that sensitive and um, which ones you can put together in one bag and which ones you should ship single packed and um, so be because this is very different and uh, from species to, to species it's never the same so that's a process of uh, many many years you really have to learn uh, how you have to pack the fish and also of course uh, you need to know how to to prepare the packing water and um, all these things you really need to know so it's not done that you're just uh, catching the fish put them in a the bag and send them out so you really uh, need to to learn it and it takes a lot of years. And I think that I'll add to that, that also on uh, the back end of it, uh, the customer receiving the fish is also important that they understand the fish that they just got and what's the best way to uh, acclimate them and introduce them to the new tank, such as uh, a quarantine tank, which I preach all the time. Um, it doesn't matter where your fish come from, uh, you need a quarantine tank. Uh, even if you can't uh, add another tank to your house, if your wife, your girlfriend says no more tanks, you could get uh, little 20 gallon totes or, or anything plastic from Lowe's and rig something up. Um, and this isn't just for sickness of the fish, although fish do get stressed during shipping and, and things can happen. But the biggest thing is, uh, for all you hap guys, for example, if you have a 220 gallon tank with a bunch of big haps in it, and you order five new haps, and they're not nearly as big as the ones that you have, for example, uh, and those poor guys come out of a dark box after they've been shipped for 24 hours maybe, and they go in the tank, and the big fish, the established fish, are just on them and sometimes it can be relentless sometimes they will kill the new fish and most of the times the stress caused will cause trouble for the new fish um, so it's super important to have a quarantine tank for your new arrivals so ron wants to know what is new for thomas business wise is there anything new new coming up with with your business Oh yeah, um, what I can say, um, at the moment we are, we are building a, a new fish house, let's say. Yes, I saw the picture. Yeah, and uh, of course that will be great because it's going to be a very big one. And uh, then when it's it's nearly to be finished, I, I guess we will take an, it will take another maybe two to three months. And then we can start to, to put the tanks in and it's a really, really nice um, fish house and we have space for about 1,000 tanks in different sizes, so that will give uh, us the possibility to to keep in stock a really, really wide and nice assortment of all the of all the cichlids. So um, this is what we are doing at the moment. So I that mean, means more fish. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, the fish, we, uh, the fish house which we have at the moment is also not small, and uh, also at the moment we we are able to to supply quite a lot of nice and beautiful fish. But that will be even better, and of course, uh, when everything is new, uh, it will be just beautiful and gives a lot of possibilities. That's great. Yeah. And I know a lot of you guys have noticed that uh, months back, once I stopped. Uh, getting fish from my previous supplier that had the big, huge, huge list. Uh, a lot of you have noticed that, you know, the list isn't as big with the new supplier. Uh, but rest assured, based off of what Thomas just said, it's going to be really, really good. You know, we just have to hang in for a little while and then it's going to be even better than it was before. Yeah, and also what I can add to that is, um, you know, it's, it's always nice to, to look at a, a real, real big stock list. But, you know, at the end, in my opinion, it's always more important that uh, the fish arrive, are in good quality, the fish uh, uh, are like you want it, the fish are like ordered, you know, and not uh, just getting a lot of fish, but uh, maybe are not being happy with quite many of them, you know, because uh, this also to me, is the more more important part. So quality over quantity. Every yeah, day. all day, every yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Someone wants to know: Are any new altos coming in? Alto Marcologus. Um. Uh, pretty much just now is the goldhead, right? Yeah. Copperhead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the copperhead and um, what what I already had in stock though is um, it's a very rare compressed set from Congo. Oh. It's the compressed set Zaire. And it looks a little bit like calvus because it has unusual many spots on the body. I mean, unusual for it compressed sets, you know. And I have a, not too many of them available, but uh, I think at about maybe ten pieces. So, if somebody is interested in a rare alto number of ogres, that's a really rare one because uh, I think a lot of you people know that uh, getting fish from Congo is very very difficult. So uh, those from Piritza are rare and, and quite special in my opinion. So I'll get Thomas to shoot me uh, some pictures and video when he returns yeah. of those. And uh, the next wild Tanganyikan import is going to be uh, what late December? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. After, after that's the what, holidays. That's what I planned. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Giov Giovanni said, "Shout out from Canada." He wants to know what do you use in the packing water additives or anything for long flight? What kind of additives do you put in the bag when you are shipping the fish? Uh, for me, um, I use uh, just a really good water conditioner uh, that neutralizes the ammonia, uh, any metals in the water, um, and it also adds uh, slime coat. Uh, to the fish and uh, keeps them from uh, breaking down. Um, uh, and I know Thomas, uh, Thomas, tell them what you use. Yes, um, I'm using, um, it's a product which I found in, in, in the UK and um, it's made specially for, for tropical fish but also for koi carp and uh, they just put it into the, especially made for that and I don't know exactly uh, what what it, what it is, I mean the chemicals, I don't know exactly, but it's specially made uh, for this reason and uh, to, to uh, calm the fish down a little bit during the, the time of the transport. And this is what, what I am adding to the packing water when I, when I ship for more than 24 hours, for example. Um, Antonia wants to know, her husband is searching for Trema Takara. Trimetacara. Vino tilapia nasus. Fluorescent green. Uh huh. Okay. Um, any chance they might be available? Very, very difficult. I, I can imagine that you are looking for them because, especially, the Trimetacara is a beautiful, beautiful fish. But they, after collecting, usually they always die. So it's nearly impossible to import them as wild fish. And um, from time to time, I have one breeder who can successfully breed them from time to time, but uh, it's very, very rare to find. And uh, so the chance to get them is, is very low. And um, 
the Xenophilapia uh, you are talking about is um, the problem with them is that they live quite deep in the in the lake. So you you have to go down to about 40, 50 meters to get them. So uh, let's say there is a chance, but uh, also that chance is, is not very big. So um, I don't want to promise anything about those two fish. Any breeders for that Xeno? Not at the moment. She said, thank you, gentlemen. So I have a question about the collection process. Some people don't realize what exactly, you know, you go through to get the fish directly from the lake. So can you kind of explain? Thomas, yeah. Because Thomas, you've been to Africa. Yeah, can you ask again? I didn't how, ask. how does the collection process work? Oh, ah, okay. Well, how do they catch the fish? Yeah, how do they find them, catch okay. them? From the lake? Yes, yes, I can explain, no problem. Us, yeah. Finally. You, you, yeah, usually it starts like um, that I, I'm choosing the fish I, would, I want to get, and then I, I send uh, the collecting team, the divers, I send them out to the places where the fish live, which I want, would like to import, and then they go by boat and they have their nets and they have a diving compressor, and I must say, they are really, really good in, in, in catching fish because nobody of us can put ever do it like they can. And uh, you must imagine that there, the, the lake is full of rocks and the fish they like to hide, but they are always able to, to get them out. So they are really doing a good job in that. So, so they, they make a, a travel with their boat and they collect the fish I ordered. And then they go back and then um, they, how, they hire a truck. And then the truck comes to the to the lake to pick up the fish, and then the fish will stay during this time in very big uh, plastic uh, uh, totes, IBC totes. Yes, is what we call exa them. exactly. So they stay there in in the lake water. There's lake water inside, of course, and they get an air supply, and then they will be transported by a truck to. There is a big city in Tanzania which has an international airport and. That city is Dar es Salaam, maybe you heard about it. So they will bring the fish with a truck to Dar es Salaam, and this is about 1,000 kilometer, which is in miles, I don't know. Oh, isn't it uh, close to a 50 hour drive? 40 hours? Yeah, about non -stop. two days, about yeah. two days non -stop, driving. Non stop on dirt roads, yeah. no paved yeah. roads. Um, uh -huh. So it's not an easy process no, no. to get them but, from the lake well, but I, if, all the way to... If you want, I can go on. It's finished <laughs> quickly. So after the fish arrived in Dar es Salaam, they have their, their fish houses there, and then they just have to, uh, to book the flight, in my case, to Munich, Germany. So they will pack the fish, and they will deliver them to the international airport in Dar es Salaam, and then they will be sent to Munich and then, then I go to the airport in Munich, pick them up and bring them to my fish house. So this is how it works. Um, Robert wants to know, there are different opinions about cichlid salt. What is your what is your opinion about salt for the for the tanks? Um are you are you talking about aquarium salt? He said cichlid salt. Cichlid salts, uh, meaning maybe a sea chem product. Uh, I'll assume that's what you're talking about. If not, you know, let us know. But um, any uh, it really depends on your water and where you live and, and how soft or hard your water already is. Um, uh, the only salts, I make my own buffer. Uh, uh, but for you, if you just have one tank, uh, yes, the sea chem products, uh, the cichlid salt, the buffer, um, they all have trace elements of what these fish uh, strive in in their natural habitat. Um, is it going to make a huge difference? Are you going to tell night and day difference? Uh, probably not, but uh, just know that some salts in the water, not aquarium salt, but actual uh, cichlid salts are beneficial to the fish. Yeah. Especially, I would, I can add to that. Especially after you got new fish, it's always very good because uh, um, that uh, the skin yes. will recover faster with the salt. Yeah, I keep uh, uh, 
rock salt here in the shop. Um, and when we get new fish in, we put rock salt in those tanks. And uh, it's crazy. The fish will just hover over the pile of rock salt. Uh, and you can tell they're just really, really loving it. Jason Brown said, go dogs. <laughs> yeah, go dogs. Uh, we, we took Thomas to the Auburn game this past Saturday. Uh, it was here in Athens. And uh, Thomas had never experienced American football before. So it was a lot of fun uh, to share that with him uh, and let him see how crazy it is. Yes, it was. <laughs> Robert said he's using cichlid lake salt. Yeah, yeah. Um, either way, yeah, cichlid lake salt is good. Uh, it's fine. Uh, again, not necessary. You don't have to rush out and buy any, but uh, some people will tell you it's useless. Um, I'm no scientist, uh, but I, I think that uh, cichlid salts in your aquarium is beneficial for the fish. So Thomas, what do you feed your fish? Because I know that you and Butch have talked and um, some people's feeding habits are different than others. Yeah. So I know you feed your fish something different. Uh, or, and, and how often you feed them. Uh, I like to feed, for example, uh, frozen cyclops, and uh, especially for the Tanganyikans, uh, they love it, and then some granulate, and uh, also flake food. Just, uh, you know, meanwhile you can, can buy really good quality food, so um, yeah, it's, not, it's not that difficult to find good fish for the, for the food for the fish anymore. So uh, what I like is to change from time to time so they can get different kinds of food and you always have to take care a little bit of uh, what do they eat in nature, you know, you have a predator uh, fish, uh, they need more protein, you have uh, like trophies, they, they need more like algae and uh, things like this, you know, and uh, spirulina. So for that you have to take care a little bit, but on the other hand, it's not difficult to feed the fish. And then, Butch, I know you use Northfin. Yes. Yeah, I use Northfin. Um, I really like Northfin. I've been using it for several years, and that's the staple food here. Uh, I feed them all cichlid formula. Um, and then, of course, uh, algae eaters will get the, uh, the green pellet, the spirulina pellet. And, um, for my personal fish at home, I include the krill pellet also, uh, just for some added protein and color enhancement. So you really want to just look for a good quality food? Yeah, quality food is important. Um, it's really important to read the ingredients. Um, what is the first and second and third ingredient in the food. Um, you don't want to feed a food that has too many fillers. Uh, think of it like, a, like dog food, for example, you know, uh, you're supposed to stay away from the grain foods uh, because your dog doesn't eat grain um, and they get no benefit from it. So uh, a good quality food with quality ingredients uh, is just as important for your fish as it is your dog or cat, or... Yourself. Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a question. Um, as someone who has had African cichlids and feeding them, how do I know if I'm feeding them too much or if I'm not feeding them enough? I think that's, that's pretty easy uh, because um, you just have to take care for the amount you put into the tank. So, and you just have to make sure that within not more than five to six minutes, it should be all eaten. 
So uh, if that if that is going to happen, you did the right amount. You know, if after 10 minutes there's still some food floating in the tank, you put too much. Okay, so it's not that difficult. And some fish will eat until they literally explode. You know, yes. like trophies, they will beg and beg and beg and beg and will eat as much as you give them. Um, but don't do that. No. <laughs> So five to six minutes is a yeah. good yeah. time frame. Yes. How many fish would you say? Because I mean, no. if I have three fish versus 20. Yeah, of course the amount will be different that okay. you put in. But within five to six minutes, it should yeah. be. Yeah, you don't want lots of excess food on the bottom of your tank. And if you have a lot of excess food on the bottom of your tank, you are overfeeding. Um, so cut back on your food. Also add some uh, Cynodonis catfish, and they will help keep the bottom clean food. Not eat algae, but just old food on the bottom. Um, I have another question. What are the what are the top illnesses that the fish um, can get? What are the top sickness that, that that you see? The most common sickness that you see. Well. Uh, I can say, for me, uh, it's typically ick during the time of year when the temperature goes from summer to fall and the temperature in the building really fluctuates. Uh, that always causes ick to pop out, um, the, the temperature fluctuation. Uh, but that's pretty easy to get under control uh, with your temperatures in your water. Um, you know, of course, there are some challenging uh, things to deal with, uh, especially when you get uh, wild caught fish. Uh, they tend to sometimes have some bugs that they bring in from the lake. Um, but, uh, you know, again, if, if uh, you're going to be serious about keeping these fish, uh, it's important to get serious about uh, properly diagnosing what the fish has and uh, treating with the right medication, not just throwing a medication out of fish, uh, because a lot of times if you don't know what you're treating for and you use the wrong medication, you end up hurting the fish more than if he was sick. Um, uh, Thomas and I talked about it, uh, how we both do it, and, and it's the same as far as when the fish first come in. Uh, we don't just treat the fish, uh, we, we observe. If we see something going on, uh, then we treat for that appropriate uh, illness or sickness or disease uh, rather than just throwing medicines in the tank uh, for newly arrived fish. Uh, Thomas, do you have any more to expand on, the, on that, the medication? No, no, I absolutely agree with you. I do the same. Uh, first of all, you have to look, uh, especially after importing them from, from Africa, you uh, have to really take care for them very well for the first days, and uh, yeah, and usually if, if they get a problem, um, it's not so difficult to find out because uh, uh, we are lucky because uh, when those African cichlids they get some sicknesses, they usually get always the same ones. So uh, we are used to the, to them already, and uh, we have a good chance to to cure the fish with uh, with the correct and the right medicine. So. I think that's all about it. So what are the top medicines that you think everyone who keeps African cichlids should have on hand? Here in America, what I always suggest is to always have metronidazole, uh, quick cure, or any uh, a red ink type product that's blue that has uh, Malachi green in it. Um, a prazi quantrel and uh, something for fungus like a nitrofurazone, uh, also bacterial oxytetracycline. Uh, those are the main uh, medicines that I use here. Uh, it just depends on what the fish has, uh, what's going on. For example, with uh, Malawi fish, if I notice. Uh, the signs of bloat coming on, and we all know that bloat is a very broad uh, term for sickness. Uh, but typically it starts with 
uh, the fish mouthing food and, and, and spitting it out and not eating it. Uh, then they'll start kind of hanging off by themselves. Uh, the breathing gets very fast. Uh, if you can catch it right around that time, I use metronizable. Uh, I prefer to catch the fish out of the tank uh, because if you have a, a 300 gallon tank, um, it doesn't make sense to treat the whole thing. I like to catch the sick fish out, treat him in a smaller quarantine tank. Um, if he doesn't respond to the metronize at all, uh, then I go to Praziquantrol. Um, and that typically will take care of any uh, internal issues. Uh, if you have bacterial or fungal issues, you know, you use uh, tetracycline for bacterial, uh, nitrofurazin green for funguses. Um, you know, there's a lot of good information on different uh, fish pharmaceutical websites where you can read up about the different medicines and what they do, uh, what the fish's symptoms are. Um, so uh, that's what I use here. I also will get a medicated flake food uh, that has the Prazicontrol or Metronazidol in it. And for example, uh, once I pull out a sick fish, I will feed my fish the medicated food just to be sure that they're okay, you know, because the fastest way to get the medicine in them is by eating it, getting it in their guts versus in the water column. Um, um, so Ron, sorry, did you want to continue? Oh uh, no, I was done. I was going to see if Thomas wanted to say oh, anything. Oh no, no, I have the same opinion and I, I do pretty the same. Okay. Um, Ron wants to know, he said, Thomas, I'm sure you've seen many breeders. Why is the European fish so much better than domestic fish here in America? <laughs> I think I tried to explain that already earlier. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just that um, maybe you didn't hear me, but uh, it is uh, if you did not hear me before. It is just that we are in Europe. We are always taking care for really, really good quality breeding fish. So uh, we always try to get wild fish for breeding, and uh, we always like to to change uh, some of the fish into the breeding and bring some new ones into the breeding group so that we can always have uh, like uh, a fresh blood in the in the group. Quality. It's, and that makes the quality and that makes um, that you can get very beautiful fish when you when you get babies. But you guys are just more selective than, than American They're just breeders. more, they're a lot more serious about it over there. Uh, they take it much more seriously than we do. And correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas, but a lot of those guys specialize in two or three species versus 15. Yeah. So they do right. a very, very good job on two or three fish versus trying to do 15 species. Yes. Yeah, no, that's right. Absolutely. Um, so Antonio wants to know, male or female Neolamprologus nigroventrator, any distinguishing characteristics to look for? I no, on this fish, it's, it's really, to be sure, you really have to vent them. So they have to be vented? Yes. Why does he have some? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough one to get. <laughs> she, she, she didn't say. Tell her if she got too many babies, we can take them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So how hard is it to vent fish? I've seen Butch do it many times with different species. Thomas is a master. <laughs> like, um, all these years, uh, if Thomas tells me it's a male or female on some of the smallest fish ever, he's just about always dead on. Uh, I remember back when Thomas was with the previous company, um, Thomas took a lot of holidays, and if, 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 if I was doing a shipment while Thomas was on a holiday, I typically would put it off, if I could, until Thomas returned, because I knew that if Thomas was packing my fish, he was going to send me what he tells me he's going to send me. Yeah, and maybe I can, maybe I can try to explain, um, what I usually do, uh, first of all, 
like Donald said, I'm, I'm doing this job now full time for 30 years, so I got a lot of experience and I got really a massive amount of fish in my hands during this time. And um, yeah, and it is like, um, because I have a lot of people around me, they, they say they are so happy uh, having me to, to venting the fish and finding out the sex of the fishes. And uh, it is, I think, meanwhile, I think it is also some kind of a talent I got. <laughs> No, it's really yeah, true. Yeah, because, yeah, 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 because there are, sure. there are also sure. other people doing this job for a long time. But there, are, you know, I don't want to talk good about myself. But I, but I know the, the the time showed that in most of the cases I'm right. So I think it's a combination of um, of the experience, of having the talent, and also having good eyes. <laughs> 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 and uh, because it is really difficult, you, uh, because. It, you know, when, when you try to bend the fish, it is uh, not all the species look the same. You, they all look, most of them, they look different. So you really got to check on that for a long, long time to find out how they have to look like and how you can really distinguish it, okay? And uh, so I, I think I just got it. <laughs> he, definitely, he definitely has it, yes. Okay. Um, someone wants to know, what size tank is that behind you? It is a 300 gallon tank. It's eight feet long, uh, two feet wide, and 30 inches tall. And there are uh, Cipacromus yellowhead and Benthachromus tricotti in this tank right now from Lake Tanganyika. Ron says, wow, my sips look great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they said the tank is beautiful. Yes, they are great. So, just a question. What is, Thomas, what is your, personally, your favorite part of keeping fish? Um, okay. I started at the age of six or seven years and getting all crazy to keep fish at home and I, I think I bred my first cichlids and I think I was eight years old so uh, I never stopped doing this and uh, now as I already explained it became my profession and now I must say that meanwhile it changed a little bit because now for me um, the most in interesting thing about all that what I'm doing is everything around it. Traveling to Africa, organizing the shipments, uh, visiting my friends in the business like Donald, and uh, yeah, having all those possibilities. Um, so, it, it, what can I say, it improved in that way uh, that it's not now not longer keeping the fish, it's more all around it. So it changed a little bit for me. But um, yeah, but I already had it not too long ago. I had a one room in my house with uh, 32 tanks and I was uh, breeding fish there. But now, um, honestly, I don't have any fish at home anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thomas, what is your favorite fish from Malawi and Tanganyika? <laughs> Uh, from Malawi, I love very much all the different petrochromous types, even if some of them are very difficult to keep, but they are just so impressive. And um, from Malawi, um, it's not just one fish. I, I like most all the predators from Lake Malawi. All the gems, uh, Tyranochromis, Chromis, Nimbochromis, those are, are the ones I really like. What about you, Butch? It's really hard. Um, from Tanganyika, I, there's just so many great fish and not enough tanks to keep them all in. Um, I change all the time. I mean, I love frontosa. Uh, I love feather fins. I love sandfish. Uh, it's, it's very, very hard to pick a favorite. Uh, kind of the same with Malawi. Um, 
there's so many different ones, and and we in America are more of the all male show tank, um, which is great. But I'm telling you, if you set up a species only tank of say a, a group of Lethernops red cap or uh, any group of your favorite peacock, and you have a species only biotope tank with uh, two or three males and six or eight females, you would really be able to enjoy that particular fish for what it really is at its very best. Um, so having said that, it's very hard for me to pick a favorite uh, Malawi fish, but uh, I've always had a special place for peacocks because that's what first got me into this um, back in the early 90s when I saw my first Jacob Freeburgi in the pet store. You know, that was it. I, you know, I had to have peacocks. Um, um, but I also love predator hats, um, so it's, it's hard. It's hard to name a baby. Yeah, it's really hard. Jason wants to know if 75 gallons is too small to keep trophies. No, it is not too small. Um, you can keep trophies in a 75. Uh, you just don't want to go uh, too, too, too many. Uh, I think uh, 20, uh, 20 pieces in a 75 is, is about right. Uh, ratio uh, as many females to males as you can get. Frankie, Frankie Kenneth popped in and said, hey. What's up, Frankie? Frankie is my friend from Virginia, he takes all of the photographs oh. of these fish. Very, very nice. Yeah, very nice. He's very nice. Yeah. So I know here in America they have the fish show. Do they have that over in Europe? They don't have no. anything like that? No, we don't have fish shows. The problem about that is um, that our government, uh, especially in Germany, they ask for so many rules you have to follow if you want to do that with, uh, with live fish. So uh, that um, it got down very much because you have to take care to do everything right and don't do a mistake. And so um, it's not that easy to do it. And I think that's the reason why it somehow stopped. I've learned from Thomas's visit here that there are a lot of rules in here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's one thing for sure. <laughs> so Diane says she is a novice with a 90 gallon tank and she's having a hard time with algae. What is the best way to handle this? Um, don't leave your lights on too long. I would uh, put my lights on a timer. No more than eight hours a day, I'd have them come on and go off at the same time. And indirect sunlight, direct sunlight, if the tank is getting too much sunlight during the day, that's going to cause algae. Uh, phosphates in your uh, tap water will cause algae. Um, there's lots of different types of algae. Uh, so time, uh, the time that your lights are on is very important. Uh, I like to use bristle nose uh, placostomus in all my tanks to eat the algae. And they do a very, very good job and they're pretty hardy and they acclimate well to the harder water and do a really good job of eating the algae. But um, the biggest thing is figuring out why you have the algae. Um, so there's no kind of chemical to use. Uh, there are chemicals, but it's uh, basically just going to be the last. It's just a, a cover up for what you're doing wrong. Maybe also some more often water change. Yes, yes, yes. More frequent water change. Right. Yes. Like I say, it just depends. Yeah. You you must discover what the problem is. What's causing the algae? And most of the times, it's too much light, whether it be the aquarium light or direct or indirect sunlight. So, someone commented about the Tropius. Um, he says that 75s will always fail when males get large. Full-grown ma adult males can wipe out a whole colony. 
A 125 is best for trophies. Well, yes, of course. The bigger the better. A 125 is best, uh, but I've kept trophies colonies in 75 gallons many, many, many years with great success back when I bred fish, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, I mean, not that what you're saying is not true, um, but uh, you can do it in a 75. Each group is different. Uh, some males are, are more murderous than others. It just, there's a lot of different factors. You want to have a lot of rock, right? Or he says big rocks for line of sight breakage. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I always like to do piles, different piles, so each male uh, could spread out and claim his own pile. Um, I've done it with rocks all the way across the whole tank. Uh, but again, also the key to it is the ratio. If you have too many males, they're just going to fight uh, and kill each other and never breed because all they want to do is fight. Um, um, is there a trophius that is easier to keep as far as starting out? I, not so much a species, but the difference in a wild caught and a tank raise, there's a difference in ease. Uh, the tank raise is not as uh, hard to, to maintain than a fresh bob pot. So, in your opinion, they're all, all trophies are about the same as far as difficulty? What I can say after my experience is that all the, the, the rainbow types, I don't know, Upulungu, Charitika, Red Rainbow, I don't know how you call it here in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, those types are, uh, of trophies are a little bit more cool, let's say. Like, for example, an Ecola or Icola. Mm -hmm. you know, Icola. Or, yeah. Cherry Spot. Yeah, exactly. So there is somehow a difference, but uh, not a really big one, but there is one. In the wilds. No, also, oh, in, also, the, also in the captivity. Okay. So if you're starting out, you would want to start out with a... If you're just starting trophies, yeah. get tank raised. Get tank raised. Yeah. Okay. And learn learn what you're doing before you invest in a wild group because if you jump into a wild group and you've never kept trophies before, um, you could make a mistake and not be happy. And you want to make sure they're vented properly. You hear a lot of stories about people like getting, don't think they're getting males or females, and the wrong ratio could be bad. Yes, venting is important. Yeah. Someone says, I've come to realize most people with cichlids tend to go more towards the 125 gallon. Do you recommend, what's the minimum size that you would recommend someone starting out? Well, Again, it all is dependent upon what type of fish you're going to keep. Um, if you have the means for your first aquarium to be 125 gallons, that's a great size tank uh, that you can do a lot of different things with as far as a Malawi setup, a Tanganyikan setup. Uh, you have a lot more versatility with a six foot tank than you do with a four foot tank. Um, I say, if you're just getting into it, a 125 is a great size to start off with. Uh, just kind of like with a big screen TV, if you go too small and you get home and you wish that you had gotten a bigger TV, uh, so I would say go 125. And uh, if you don't have anyone to tell you no, go as big as you can. <laughs> So should you, do you want to show everyone the new water system and, or give a tour of the shop? Uh, so. We were just going to go look at uh, a couple different fish okay. uh, and talk about some of them. Are we ready to do that? Okay.
All right. So first, uh, we will look and talk a little bit about these wild-caught uh, Protomelis uh, lobochilus. Now, Thomas, do you guys still call these Eclectochromis or Protomelis? Uh, I prefer to call them Eclectochromis because that's the correct scientific name for them because they have been uh, described um, under this name already quite a long time ago and there is uh, one very uh, good and scientific book existing uh, from Eccles and Trevowas and in that book you can you can find that uh, the correct name of uh, this fish is Eclectochromis but uh, unfortunately in, in all of the in all, all of the books you can find uh, usually uh, the name uh, Protomelas is used for them and Thomas was telling me that <clears throat> this wild caught Lobochilus is different than the tank raised Lobochilus herte that we all know. Uh, tell them a little bit about the difference, Thomas. Yeah, that's, uh, it's pretty easy to explain because uh, that Lobochilus, uh, which you see here, they are collected in Tanzania. That's why I call them Lobochilus Tanzania and um, they have a little bit less yellow on the chin than the original Herte and the original Herte comes only from the Malawi coast so uh, that one is not even existing in Tanzania but uh, they are pretty much related and um, yeah, the difference is not too big but uh, there are two different kinds of fish. And I get asked all the time Thomas uh, some of these thick lip fish such as uh, Lobochilus and Ornatus and Chilechromus Uchilus. Uh, why don't the tank raised have big lips? Why do only wild caught have the thick lips? Uh, yeah, um, the reason for that is that those fish with the with the big lips, um, they usually they scrap on the rocks to find their food, and they do it whole day long. And that's the reason why uh, on those species the lips are growing when, when the fish get older. It's because of this uh, continuously sc uh, scrapping on, on the rocks. And um, so when you have the same species as a, as a tank race fish, of course they don't have to do this uh, s uh, scrapping. And so that's why the lips are not growing. That's the only reason. So it's kind of like working out, lifting weights with your arms. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, these are really nice. Um, uh, lots of nice males in this tank. Um, so, now we're going to come down and talk about some Alanacara. Uh, so, in this tank, uh, we have uh, the, the Malari Malari, uh, some uh, Ruby Red, and a Eureka Red, a Eusicea, and some young Tetrastigma. Uh, but the Malari Malari, I wanted Thomas to talk about a little bit. Uh, I get asked all the time, what is the difference? Why is it all yellow? Um, so, uh, if I'm not mistaken, what I've come to know is that at Malari Malari, uh, the fish is more yellow but that over the years they've been line bred to become even completely yellow. Is that right, yeah, Thomas? Yeah, that's right. Because especially the ones you see here, they have nearly no blue left on them. So uh, because when you when you get uh, wild malaria, which is in, in the meantime very, very difficult because uh, malaria island became a, a natural park, so it's not longer allowed to collect them there. But uh, in the wild, they have uh, a lot of blue lines on the gill plates. Not uh, that the gill plate is completely blue, uh, like on, on the banshee, but uh, they have blue lines on the gill plates. Uh, and uh, those ones, which you see here, they are yeah, really, com really completely yellow. And this is uh, 
Donald is right, this is because of some line breeding. But um, yeah, I like that very much because um, as all of you know, it's not that easy to find completely yellow uh, peacocks in Lake Malawi. So I guess it's, it's nice to have it for the hobby. Yes. Um, the Ruby Red, is this the one that you call Rotor Kaiser? Yes. And what does Rotor Kaiser mean? Uh, Kaiser means Kaiser. <laughs> It's like a king. Okay. <laughs> and um, Roder, better to say Roter in German language, means just red. Oh, okay. So, the Red King. The Red King. Yes. Um, and this, uh, this strain that comes uh, from this particular reader, uh, they're orange now at this size. But as they grow larger, the orange really, really intensifies and becomes uh, a shade of red, for sure. Uh, it's not just a, a, a bright orange uh, fish. Uh, very, very nice strain. Um, all right, so now we're going to go back this way, talk about another. So here are uh, Protomelis spilinotus tanzania and Thomas, a lot of people in this country uh, call this Insignis, uh, which was started in the Florida farms back in the 80s and has stuck. Uh, but in fact, this is not Insignis. No, it's absolutely not because uh, insig uh, the Insignis is also existing in the lake and it's a completely different species. From time to time I can uh, also import one or two Insignis here and there because uh, uh, in the lake they're very rare and not easy to find. But uh, it's a completely different fish so to call this uh, Spilonodos is it's just uh, Insignis, it's, it's just a mistake, not right. more than that. And the funny thing is, to me, is that uh, this fish, the Tanzania, and the real Insignis look nothing alike. Nothing no, alike. No, absolutely not. I don't know. I, I think it just came up that somebody, you know, and I think it happened in the middle of the 90s when, in, when most of the Tanzanian Malawis came in, and uh, I was also there uh, uh, collecting quite a lot of them by myself at this time, and... Um, yeah, so I think somebody just gave them the name Insignis by mistake, and so maybe in, in Germany nobody calls them Insignis anymore, so uh, you just have to get rid of that, that name here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. Um, and now another one of my favorite peacocks, always, uh, Alanakara Kabui. Really, really nice blue and red. Um, Thomas was telling me that the breeder that these came from, uh, they're just superb compared to some of the other ones that we've got uh, over the years. And I can say that the quality of these is just really, really good. The, the red and the fins is just incredible. Yeah, and what I can say about them, uh, originally th this peacock comes from Mozambique and um, it's not easy to get fish out of Mozambique uh, and that's why compared to a lot of other peacocks you cannot get too many wild ones of them. Uh, so they are not often available and so you really have to take care for a good line and to keep it nice and clean and um, so that's not that easy and that line which we have here is really a beautiful one. I, I also like them a lot. Yeah, they're super duper blue and the red is just intense. The most intense red I've seen on Kobui that have come into the shop. Really, really nice. Uh, there are also some little Placidochromus uh, Jolly Reef in this tank. Uh, which is another great, great hat. Um, i got a couple in here that are showing a little color, but uh, hopefully on the upcoming shipment we'll get some more of those. That's always a favorite. So, 
I think those were the tanks that we wanted to just to show you guys tonight. Babies? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. We, we have one more. Uh, we had uh, some wild-caught Tyrannochromus. Uh, Thomas sent me, uh, I think, shipment before last. There's the dad right there. And they, uh, he spawned with a female. And when Thomas got here the other day, he uh, said, you're going to have Tyrannochromus babies. And I said, okay. And so Thomas caught her. Uh, and she gave us like, oh, probably 60 babies, um, free swimming babies. So there they are, a bunch of little fat Tyrone crumbs. <laughs> Thomas has been taking very good care of these babies and feeding them very well. <laughs> and they're very happy. So I will keep these here and grow them out. And uh, once they're ready, I'll put them in one of the eight foot grow outs. Look at those little guys. Well, Do you guys have any other questions? Uh, there's a 600. Still a little cloudy. Oh god. Look at that baby eat them real. Look at, that, look at that baby. Um. So. If, if you guys have any other questions, let me know. And if not, um, you know, we'll let y'all go. And we'll get ready to go. And, uh, you know, hope that you guys enjoyed meeting Thomas and talking to Thomas. And look for the new list to come out tomorrow. Uh, oh, the step stools. I knew it. Um, yeah, uh, keep an eye out for the, for the new list. We'll have it out tomorrow. Uh, we will add the new wild caught uh, Malawi fish as soon as they arrive. And I appreciate you guys watching. Yeah, uh, and I also would like to say thank you very much for watching Southeast Cichlids, and uh, it was nice talking to you guys. Talk to you soon again. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you later.